Hey guys, I am Vanilla, a stickman that does book reviews because I want people to know my obnoxious taste in the medium that died out when people got lazy imagining stories. So they built big heavy boxes to do the imagining for them. Now, does that make me a better person? Nope, but I will make you think so after I rant on a story specifically about heaven and hell acting like a newlywed couple arguing about their future plans for their gifted child. So this book I have read is entitled Good Omens. It was written by both Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, Gaiman being the one I am more familiar with for his anthologies such as Stories and Unnatural Creatures, his short story Sunbird, and his Newberry Magnum Opus, The Graveyard Book. Terry, on the other hand, is the one I know little about, having written something called the Discworld series, but it is a series and I am a broke ass college student that lived through his parents annual income. I don't have the time and money to read a series, nor do I have the credentials for people to listen to my opinion, but hey, if I have something offensive, I'm going to just say that it is an opinion and nothing more. That works in the internet, right? Right? The story starts with a demon named Crowley, who was tasked to deliver the Antichrist to his earthly parents had been prophesied in the Bible that the war between angels and devils on earth, aka the apocalypse, will come in the future. And in this particular day and time, it is now apparent that that day will happen 11 years from now. Crowley, who had lived on earth since the day of creation, was opposed to the idea of the apocalypse happening, so he seeks guidance from a husband that ahem, ahem, sorry, angel named Aziraphale. However, Aziraphale is a good boy, and thinks that the apocalypse should happen. It's the ineffable plan of God, he said, and part of that ineffable plan is to not mind the plot holes in the Bible. But here's an essay detailing a reasonable argument as to why the plan seems out of logic, said Crowley. La la, God works in mysterious ways. Okay, but what if I told you that heaven's taste in music sucks ass? Oh, oh, oh no, it's doubt. You son of a bitch, I'm in. So in the 11 years that passed, they made sure that the boy was in the space between good and evil. That way, neither of their sides have a chance in winning the final battle, and the boy would not be interested in the fight cause if you ain't interested in the Lakers nor the Cavaliers, your next instinct would be to switch to Discovery Channel because it's Shark Week. However, what they do not know is that they were teaching the wrong boy. A mix-up happened when the Antichrist arrived at the hospital, and it's a convoluted situation that made me think about offspring genocide, but to keep it short, the Antichrist has been given to the wrong parents and was named Adam Young, while the wrong child was given to the right parents and was named after a League of Legends used name that people bully you for in high school. Crowley and Aziraphale noticed this too late and by that point, the apocalypse was just days away. So in a desperate attempt, they searched for clues and documents detailing the location of the actual Antichrist. Meanwhile, Adam Young was having a fun and innocent time with his friends that makes you stop and reflect on how you were once that kind of kid. But you're now a bitter young adult with nothing left to hope for. Thanks for making me feel horrible about myself, Gaiman. This all changed when Adam ran across Anathema Device, who gave him a bunch of Alex Jones articles that awakened the power within him. It, it makes much more sense if you read the book. So Adam started becoming crazy with power, he ditched old friends and thought of joining in with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, death, war, famine, and pollution. But just as he was about to be corrupted, his old friends talked him out of it and he was back to normal. Meanwhile, Aziraphale finally solved their worries by finding the Antichrist location through the nice and accurate prophecies of Agnes Nutter, which. So Crowley, Aziraphale, and a bunch of these normie blokes that social media doesn't care about, get around Tadfield base to stop the upcoming apocalypse. However, the angels, demons, and the four horsemen have already arrived, but Adam was there to stop it, once and for all. Adam, we are here to hack the government computers and make them shoot missiles on Mother Earth. Adam, what are you fucking doing? 
Daddy is going to print mad at you! Exclamation. everyone live happily ever after. Unless you've seen that part in the Amazon Prime adaptation wherein Crowley and Zerophil overlated an entire female phantom, but I'm not going into detail on that because jokes aside, the only people who would listen thoroughly to the summary are people who didn't watch Good Omens. And if I'm genuinely being honest here, the show really did deserve the hype got on Tumblr. I brought this book back in 2018 before it became the thing that it is back in 2019. And when I finished it, just before people started talking about it, it definitely was an entertaining story for me. The thing that hooked me was its tone. It was never really quite serious with its storytelling. It had a cynical yet comedic vibe to it. And when it tried to be funny, it definitely delivered. You know, after reading Good Omens, I realized that the books I have read so far never effectively made me laugh. They either make jokes in order to flash out a character or set the mood of what's to come, but never made me go beyond blurting lel all the time, which is very interesting if I think about it for a while. I'm not saying that stories that do this are bad or something of that sort, but Good Omens' new take on that is pretty refreshing. It's also the kind of story where you know that the narrator even has a personality. There was this one point where no one but the narrator said that the Earth is a Libra, and it doesn't add to the story's plot, but he kind of enjoyed it for just existing as a little gag in between. There's also this paragraph right here. Milton Scraggs' second great publishing disaster occurred in 1653. By a stroke of rare good fortune, they had obtained one of the famed Los Quartos, the free Shakespeare plays never reissued in folio edition, and now totally lost to scholars and playgoers. Only their names have come down to us. This one was Shakespeare's earliest play, The Comedic of Robin Hood, or The Forest of Sherwood. Master Bilton had spent almost six guineas for the quarto and believed he would make nearly twice that much back on the hardcover folio alone. Then he lost it. Bilton Skaggs' third great publishing disaster, well that was anticlimactic, does that say that it disregarded its characters? Oh no. Crowley and Xerophil are more than just the gay power of couple of the internet. I would say that their interactions are the ones I look forward to while reading. Whenever they are on the spotlight, you always find yourself questioning who is on the right. It's not really a surprise since their own conversations are literally about the morality of the situation. Meanwhile, Adam's character arc exists to bring these complicated themes down to earth by showing us little bits of his childhood juxtaposed to his expectation of being the one to end the world. And with this sort of situation, he can't help but feel sorry for Adam because even if he's the Antichrist, he's still a kid with his own hopes and dreams. And having that being overshadowed by heaven and hell's desire to start the apocalypse is, well, heartbreaking. The character arc of Newton Pulsifier and Anathema Device were also interesting to read. It's actually somewhat similar to Adam's, but in this case, what is holding Anathema back from doing what she wants is studying the prophecies of Agnes Nutter in order to prepare for the coming apocalypse. It is a cute love story to include in this whole plot, and just adds to the theme of reaching people's thoughts and expectations versus what you want to do in life. I do have some gripes about the story though. I felt like it did not need to include the prologue they had in the Garden of Eden. It did not really add to the story and I think it is a failed attempt to fully understand the development of Crowley and Zerophil's relationship, something that they actually fixed in the TV adaptation. So. I'm glad to see that. I also didn't care about Shadwell and Madame Tracy's side story. I felt like Shadwell's character came out a bit too mean-spirited. While I don't necessarily think that mean characters equals bad character writing, there was just not enough scenes with him when I saw the true charm of his personality. Lastly, I think that the last battle with Satan was not earned in the story. It felt like the writers wanted to amp up the stakes, but Satan wasn't even given enough character development and the driving conflict of stopping this apocalypse was technically solved once the four horsemen were erased. So the fact that this whole new problem arise without any explanation felt lazy to me.
You know, despite what I dislike about Good Omens, I'm really digging the soil if I am scrutinizing this book. Overall, Good Omens is something that you must read. And if you're not into books, there's always the TV adaptation on Amazon Prime that actually fix some of the issues that I have said above. The only notable difference between the book and the show is that the book puts greater emphasis on being a dark comedy, while Prime put the focus on the charming aspects of the story through additional scenes and fantastic performances from the actors and actresses. Also, there's this weird CGI with dog that gets me under my nerves, but hey, screw that shit. Overall, I'm giving the story 6 fra pennies, 5 shillings, and a 6 pence out of 10. Good luck on doing the maths, guys.